good morning. Let's look at Genesis chapter 11 today. Genesis chapter 11. If you uh, want to follow along with this message, uh, you can do that on the Bible app. If you don't have the app, you can scan this code and it'll take you there. Please download it. If you don't have it, download it. Put it on the front page of your digital device. Make sure that you can see it. Make sure that you got a reminder, something that can... It's like, a, it's such a huge combination of things. It's a, a Bible, it's a social network, it's a devotional tool. Uh, if, you, if you subscribe to a Bible plan with someone else, then that person can see the things that you highlighted. They can see the things that you put in the notes. You can see the things that they put in the notes. You can do plans with multiple people. And so... Uh, uh, I've done Bible plans with friends. I've done Bible plans with uh, my kids and Pastor Sonny. And it's, it's amazing to be able to see the things that they put in there and the insights that they can get that will enlighten you into it. And so if you haven't downloaded it, do that on there. If you want a traditional Bible, we would love for you to have one. It's our gift to you. You can pick that up at the Welcome Center before you go. If you're watching us online, love you guys. So glad that you are with us from all over the place, but super glad that you guys are here with us in the flesh today. What a message by Pastor Barry last week. He, he came with it, man. He was dropping bombs. He had some lines in there that made me want to throw my head back and say, come on, man. Like, uh, like he said, fathers, you've been given a title that God himself calls himself. Come on, man. Or, or he said, uh, the problem with men in our culture is we die at 30, but we're buried at 80. I said, you better watch your mouth, right? Are you kidding me? Come on, man. Or, or however we define greatness is how we'll begin to pattern our lives. Or, or if you follow greatness the wrong way, you're going to find yourself in a hole that's hard to get out of, man. And, and, and can I just say that when I was in a hole, Pastor Barry was an arm that reached down because he's not just a preacher, he's a practitioner. He called us to greatness and y'all responded. I have never seen an altar on a Sunday filled with more men answering the call of God on their life. Yeah, you could clap for them. All y'all ladies should be clapping for them. And I just gotta say, I couldn't be more proud of the men in this church. There is an uprising. There is a movement of men in this church that is defying modern reason, that is defying the modern culture. Like, I hate to even say this, but most churches are very female-centric. But in this church, men are leading the way. They're, they're serving. They're going through journey and getting healthy. They're giving. They're forming communities where they're holding each other accountable. And you know, all great movements are led by people who are willing to own their shortcomings and embrace accountability. And so I already texted Pastor Dallas and I said uh, that we need to book Pastor Barry to speak next Father's Day so that he can follow up on the 100 hour challenge, which is 16.75 minutes a day where men have committed to do that with Jesus. They've just committed to spend 16.75 minutes every day and uh, by the end of that year, between Father's Day and Father's Day, they will have spent 100 hours with Jesus. We all have 16.75 minutes of every single day. Most of us spend that scrolling. Most of us spend that, spend that complaining. And so you've got, you've got the time. And uh, if you miss that, then here's the code for you to get involved in that. If you're a guy in here and you didn't see that, scan the code. We would love for you to be involved with that. Pastor Barry already told me that this Father's Day was banging. He didn't get to keep the lobby the way that he wanted. But he said, next year, Father's Day is going to be even bigger. I can't tell you some of the things that he's already told me that we're going to have next Father's Day, but it is going to be off the chain. It is going to be ridiculous. And so let me just, do, just say this. Let me just drop this little, little hint. It, if you are a guy and you're a car guy, I'm a car guy. I love, I love cars. Uh, but if you're a car guy who more than loves cars like me and you have cars, if you got a sick car, you better start polishing it now because we're going to need it next Father's Day. We're not going to give it away, FYI. You get to still keep it. We just want, if you got a sick car, I want you to drop a line uh, to Pastor Barry. And so anyway, uh, can, can you all just imagine what this church and this community are going to look like once hundreds of men have answered the call to greatness? I am so I'm so excited about the direction 
of uh, the ministry to men, of called the greatness of the guys in this church. And so I love you guys. Super proud of you. Kudos to you. Anyway, I want to continue on in this series that we're in today with the message that we're calling That's Settled. Let's pray. God, we love you. We love you for who you are. We love you for what you do. We love you because you loved us first. Before we were born, you loved us. While we were in our mother's womb, not only did you love us, you were excited for us to be born. God, you were excited for us to be born because we were only born for two things, to serve you and to be loved by you. And so God, thank you for the fact that you love us. Thank you for the fact that you have called us, that you have chosen us, that you have invited us. God, thank you for my friends who are in this place today. I pray that our hearts and our minds would be opened so that your word can be deposited and our lives can be changed. In Jesus' name, amen. God's Hall of Fame. Uh, you, you know, it's, uh, it's a common belief that the greatest players in any particular sport are inducted into their respective Hall of Fame. Uh, but that's not necessarily true. In truth, it is the greatest representatives of a particular sport who are inducted into their respective Hall of Fame. Uh, there have been plenty of players whose performance has been Hall of Fame worthy. They had all of the production. They had all of the stats. They had all of the awards. They had all of the talent. But they've never been given a place in the Hall because they lacked the integrity. They lacked the character. You know, sometimes your talent will take you places that your character can't keep you. I think Pete Rose is an example of that. <laughs> we call these slides here, and I got so excited to say this one line. This is a slide of a slide. <laughs> it's so great. That's, that's such a dad joke. But it's so, <laughs> he was the greatest slider of all time. If he was only awarded one thing, do you know how dangerous a head first slide is? And there are other pictures that we could have chosen where it's from the side, where legitimately he is three feet in the air sliding into the base. He is undeniably one of the greatest baseball players of all time. Rookie of the year, a three-time World Series winner, 17-time All-Star, National League MVP, World Series MVP, two-time Gold Glove winner, three-time batting champion who holds the major league record for hits with 4,256 and games played with 3,562. But Pete Rose, undeniably one of the greatest players in the history of the game, is not in the Baseball Hall of Fame because it was determined he was not a good representative of the game. He broke the cardinal rule of baseball. He bet on games, including his own. And so because of that, he had all of the talent. He had all of the statistics, but he didn't get access because he lacked the integrity. Similarly, when God was listing his hall of fame, he didn't list the most talented or even the most accomplished. He gave a list of people who represented him well in both victory and defeat, in good times and in bad. And, and, and like Pastor Barry said last week, I wish that we really could go back and dig into the stories of these heroes of Hebrews, but we, we just don't have time. The, the, the stories are so rich. They are so robust. But, but to try to fit the story of someone uh, who is of the scope of God's Hall of Fame in 27 minutes, it is, it's, it's just totally unrealistic. I mean, when you go through Hebrews chapter 11, you have people whose names made, whose names didn't make it, but their, their sacrifices did. It, it says this, there are others. I, I, I reread that this week and I, I was caught on that word. There are others. People whose names didn't get represented, but they made the hall. There are others who were tortured and refused their release so that they might gain a better resurrection. There are still others who endured mocking and flogging and even chains and imprisonment. They were stoned. They were sawed in two. They were put to death by the sword. They went around in sheepskins and goatskins, destitute, oppressed, and mistreated. The world was not worthy of them. The world huh, was not worthy of them. Come on, man. So like Pastor Barry said last week, what if you just took the time to go back and, and really read this, to spend some, some time on it, to research it, to really soak in the exploits of these men and women, the struggles and striving, the heartbreak and the victory, the courage and the tenacity 
I mean, I think sometimes when we read the Bible like it's a made-for-TV movie where Kevin Sorbo and Kirk Cameron play the lead characters, but, but this was not a PG world. This book, if you read it properly, is rated R. It has, it has all the elements necessary to make it one of those Hollywood blockbusters that when you watch the preview, you look at your buddy and you say, bro, I want to see that. I, I don't know if you've ever seen a preview and, and, and you couldn't wait for that movie to come out. Gladiator 2 is about to come out. At, bro, like, listen, I can't wait. I'm so excited. I want to be the first. I want to. I can't even stay up past 10 anymore because I'm old. But I want to sleep that day so that I could be at the midnight premiere of Gladiator 2. And the only previews that they have of Gladiator 2 so far are fake. They made them on AI. And it looks so sick that like, I, my, like Isaiah and I, Pastor Barry and I, oh my gosh, I can't wait for, for Gladiator 2 to come out. That's like, that's this book. That book is like that. Like, but some of us, we read it like, ah. like it's Hallmark. Like the people in it are past their prime. Like they're B-list actors. Like Isaiah and I, watch, my son Isaiah and I, we watched a movie this past week on Netflix. It's called The Eagle. And it's about a Roman centurion who, who wanted to avenge his father's defeat. And he wanted to restore his family name. And, it, and the movie, it just had like these, these beautiful landscapes and uh, these like really, really intense battle scenes. And as I watched it, I thought this is so sick, but it has nothing on the imagery of the scriptures. Uh, this, this book was written into a cruel and cutthroat world filled with violence and vanquish, witchcraft and sorcery, war, attrition, starvation, cannibalism, giants, and what the book of Job seems to describe as a fire-breathing dragon. I don't know if you've read that part, but I went back this week so that I could reread it, so that I could verify that he's talking about, is he talking about dinosaurs? He's talking about Godzilla. That's who he's talking about. I read that. I said, like, I said, Godzilla minus one. I'm a huge Godzilla fan. I'm going to say that right now. In fact, one time my friend and I, I don't know if you remember him, but my friend, uh, Alan Griffin, he's a uh, real big African-American guy. He's, he's like 6'3". I'm not going to tell you what he weighs because I'd be lying if I knew. Uh, He's, he's bigger than me though. So we, we uh, one time, we, we went to smuggle Bibles from Hong Kong into mainland China. And so we, we go to this warehouse and, and the, the whole building is filled with Bibles. And uh, they, they handed us uh, backpacks, me a backpack, Alan a backpack. And, uh, and, and I got a Hello Kitty backpack and he got a Power Rangers backpack. And it was like this big. It was so small. And they filled this backpack filled with Bibles. And so the guy who was running it, who's from Arkansas, he, uh, he, he's just, he's just like, send us, on, he's hand us a backpack to send us on our way. And I said, uh, do you have, do you have any advice? He said, oh yeah, just blend in. <laughs> blend. He looked like King Kong. I look like Godzilla. Like I'm just saying, like when I walk through the border, people are like, ah! Anyway, Job talked about, talked about God. He talked about a fire breathing dragon. I don't know what happened to the dragon, y'all. I don't know if he, if he didn't get on the, the ark or I, I don't know what happened to him, but he talks about like, some of you are like, I never even knew that was in the Bible. Exactly. <laughs> and it was into this type of world that these heroes of Hebrews lived filled with faith and integrity, character, and this beautiful, intimate connection with God in spite of their environment. And one of, one of those heroes isn't just a hero in our faith. He's actually a hero in three. He, he's regarded as the father of Judaism, Christianity, and Islam. It's, I'm, talking about, I'm talking about Father, Father Abraham. Father Abraham had many sons, and many sons had Father Abraham, and I am one of them, and so are you. So let's just praise the Lord, right? You, nobody, you don't get it? No, Y'all didn't go to Sunday school? <laughs> you didn't go to VBS? He said, like, right arm, left arm, right foot, turn around, Father. That's a jam, Father. We should do that one Sunday. 
How would people freak out if we, if Pastor Stephanie came up and said, and the background singer is like, anyway. Well, Abraham is the dude, is what I'm trying to tell you. And when it comes to characters in the story, Abraham plays an enormous part. He is undoubtedly a first ballot Hall of Famer. He's not only the father of the faith, he's the grandfather of Jacob, who was renamed Israel and whose sons became the 12 tribes of Israel, the 12 tribes that Jesus would choose 12 men to represent as his disciples during his earthly ministry. Some of the most monumental stories in the story are about Abraham. His life takes up a huge portion of the book of Genesis. He's talked about from chapter 11 all the way through chapter 25. Aside from Moses, no Old Testament character is mentioned more in the New Testament than Abraham. In the book of James, he's referred to as God's friend. And it is a title that isn't used for anyone else in all of the scriptures. In fact, God loved him so much that in Genesis chapter 12, he told him, I will bless those who bless you and I will curse those who curse you and all the families of the earth will be blessed through you. Can you imagine God loving you that much that he would have your back like that? Have you ever had anybody in your life who has had your back? Somebody is messing with you and if they're messing with you, they're messing with them. I got three older brothers and one of them's a G. My, uh, one time when I was in seventh grade, I had a PE teacher named Mr. Ashworth. And uh, what a bad name. Anyway, and Mr. Ashworth one time thought he'd be cool and, and he would embarrass me in front of the whole class. And I was doing something stupid, no doubt. But he grabbed me by the arm in front of the whole class and he pulled me down from the stage and I fell flat on my face. And I went home that day and I told my mom, that Mr. Ashworth had pulled me off the stage and made me fall flat on my face. And then she told my brother, Kevin. My brother, Kevin is 10 years older than me. He had a Trans Am, which proves you're bad to the bone. I'm just saying, anybody with a Trans Am, don't mess with them. He had a Trans Am with a Pioneer cassette deck in it. And when he went out, he started up the Trans Am, even though we lived three blocks from the school, he drove the Trans Am there because he was ready to prove a point. And so he started up the Trans Am and he had Boston on in the cassette deck. More than a feeling, more than a feeling. He pulled out his circle brush and he got that part going just right. And he got to the school with his jean vest on. I don't know if he had a vest on, but I'm, you know, I'm imagine because he was cool. And so he got to the school and he just kicked in the door. He said, where Mr. Ashworth at? And he went and he found Mr. Ashworth. He got all up in his business because you don't, if you mess with me, you had, to, you had to mess with my older brother, Kevin. Can you imagine that God loved Abraham so much? He said, hey, listen, Jack, if somebody blesses you, I'm blessing them. But if somebody curses you, I'm gonna curse them. That's how much God loved Abraham. In the book of Galatians, the Apostle Paul says that believers in all generations will be called the children of Abraham. That means you and I, if we are believers, we are called the children of Abraham. He's the first missionary. He's the first person to ever move away from home to pursue the call of God in his life. Over and over, he shows sacrificial, radical obedience. Like he shows a ridiculous level of obedience by listening to God when asked to sacrifice his own son, Isaac, the son that he waited a hundred years for. He was the first person to tithe, giving a tenth of everything to Melchizedek, the priest of God, just because Melchizedek served him communion. And that tithe was no joke because Abraham was one of the richest people in the world, which by the way, Melchizedek is considered an incarnation of Jesus, which means that tithing is still relevant for today. Anyway, that was for free. Abraham's importance and his impact in God's redemptive history are undeniably clear in the scriptures. But what I love is that he wasn't perfect. He had flaws. He did lots of great things, but he did some really stupid stuff too. Uh, like he had a baby with his wife's maidservant because his wife suggested it. But, but God didn't call us to listen to anybody's voice other than his. Ishmael, the son of his disobedience, is the father of Islam. And we've been in conflict with those people ever since because disobedience always creates conflict. 
In, in an effort to protect himself, Abraham lied about his wife Sarah's identity twice. He told two different kings that she was his sister, which, which in a way was culturally accurate because the Jewish people called all women that were relations to them sisters, but he wasn't doing it in that connotation. Uh, plus God's not looking for semantics, he's looking for integrity. And, and so Abraham did lots of great things, but he did some really stupid stuff too. And so gratefully, as my pastor used to say, failure is never final. And so, so Abraham serves a great redemptive story. One where God physically changes his name from Abram, which means high father, to Abraham, which means father of a multitude. God literally changed the way that everyone would refer to him for all time, and he wants to do the same for you. And so I want to look at one story in Abraham's storied life, and I want to show you how I think it impacts me and how it impacts you. It is a story of destiny. You know, destiny is a dangerous destination. When you're pushing toward your dreams and God's destiny, the enemy will do everything he can to try to derail you, to try to stop you. Uh, watch this. This is Genesis chapter 11. It says, one day Terah took his son Abram, his daughter-in-law Sarai, and his grandson Lot, and he moved from Ur of the Chaldeans, which I wish I could pause there for a second, but if you remember during the spiritual warfare series, what did the Chaldeans represent? They represented demonic spirits, okay? So he, he took him, Abraham was born and raised in a land that was filled with people that were filled with demonic spirits. He, he, he was headed from the land of Canaan, but they stopped at Haran and they settled there. So one day, Terah took his son, Abram, his daughter-in-law, his grandson. They moved from Ur of the Chaldeans. He was headed for the land of Canaan. But they stopped at Haran and they settled there. There's two key words here. Stopped and settled. Ur was one of the largest, wealthiest, most important cities in the world at that time. It was the hub of commerce. It was, a, it was a port city. And in the center of the city, there was a temple to the moon god, Nanar. The, the Babylonians literally called the moon god, Nanar, the god of sin. The city built and established itself around sin. And then around the temple, uh, there was a market, there was a school, and the largest library in the world at the time. And Terah, Abraham's dad, was a big deal in Ur. He, he was the largest seller of idols of Nanar. And you couldn't enter the afterlife if you didn't worship in the temple. But you couldn't enter the temple if you didn't have an idol. And so people from all over the world were regularly making pilgrimages and, and all of them needed his idols. He, he was incredibly wealthy. He was incredibly well-known. He was incredibly influential. He was a big deal. Uh, the city of Haran, where they stopped, was similar to Ur. It was just smaller. Everything about it was the same. They had the temple in the center of town. They had the market. They had the school. And they had a smaller uh, version of the library. It was kind of like New York City and Chicago. And, and by the time they would have reached Haran, they would have been exhausted. The journey from Ur to Canaan was about 500 miles. And uh, they did it on foot. It was on dirt roads. They had to go through mountain passes and huge canyons that were littered by bandits and robbers. The journey would have been treacherous, dangerous, arduous. And, and Haran was halfway so Abraham stopped short because he didn't anticipate how grueling the journey would be. And it's not uncommon to do that in his Pulitzer Prize winning book, Goodell Escher Bach, an eternal golden braid, Douglas Hofstetter, a renowned computer scientist, came up with what's called Hofstetter's Law, which says it always takes longer than you expect. <laughs> it seems simple, but that's an often overlooked truth. Now I wonder what you're in a hurry to do or where you're in a hurry to get that's making you stop short because you didn't anticipate how grueling the journey was gonna be. You didn't anticipate how grueling marriage can be. 
You didn't anticipate how grueling raising kids can be, how grueling sobriety can be, how grueling sexual purity or fiscal responsibility would be. And so because of your underestimation, you're exhausted. I wonder, has your faith ever faltered because of fatigue? You know, you seldom make good decisions when you're tired. It's, it's literally why God built a day of rest into our weekly equation. He said, remember the Sabbath and keep it holy. Why? Not because he needed it. Because he knew you were going to need it. And so he said, keep it holy, keep it sacred, guard it with your life, guard it to your very last breath. So halfway through the journey, they reached Tehran, which would have been very familiar. It would have been very comfortable. It would have felt like home. And Terah, Abraham's dad, would have been a big deal in that town because of his status in Ur. People would have recognized him. And the minute that he hit the outskirts of town, people would have begun to murmur. Rumor would have begun to spread that the biggest seller of idols in the world had entered into their town, they would have felt flattered. They would have felt like, oh my gosh, we can't believe that we've been graced with his presence. They would have bought idols from him. He'd he'd have played a role in their spiritual journey. And so when they reached Haran, Abraham stopped partially because of fatigue and partially because of familiarity. And so when they reached Haran, Abraham settled because of his father's status. Abraham was called, but he listened to the wrong father. He listened to the wrong voice. Abraham received the calling, but Terah made the decision. And I wonder what voice are you listening to? Where have you stopped? Where have you settled? Haran was the land of comfort, but Canaan was the land of promise. Where are you living right now? Are you living in the land of comfort or are you living in the land of your calling? Have you stopped short? It's so easy to do. It's so easy to go back to what we've always known, to to go back to what we've always done, to the same people and problems, to the same habits and hangups because destiny is a dangerous destination and the enemy would do everything he can to try to stop you from getting there. And I wonder, are you gonna stop or are you gonna settle? Are you willing to sacrifice? Are you willing to surrender yourself to the plan that God has placed before you? I don't know if you know this, but the Bible says God has a plan for your life. It is a plan for good and not for bad, for a future and for a hope. You have been invited to be a vital part in the most amazing story that the world has ever known. You have been invited to be a Hebrews hero, to be a person that destiny could be a person that just that people speak of like generations from now. Like what are your great grandkids going to say about you? Are they going to say he was, uh, you know, he cheated on my great grandma. My son and I had a conversation this week. He's uh, just turned 21. He's, he's uh, going to go to Bible college in the fall. And so we were having a conversation about uh, generational curses. And so uh, he said to me, I don't think that generational curses are real. I said, well, I want you to walk that out for me. He said, I think that they're a choice. I said, okay. He said, I think, I think if your dad's an alcoholic, that doesn't mean you're gonna be an alcoholic. I think at some point you made the decision that you were gonna copy the bad behavior of his life. I don't think if your dad or your mom had mental health issues that that meant that you're gonna have mental health issues for the rest of your life because that's, that's somewhere along the line, you made a choice to not get the treatment for the trauma that somebody else put upon you. And listen, I'm not, I'm not talking bad about mental health. I've been medicated for mental health. I've been on drugs for years. I'm not on them now because I've been delivered. I've been delivered because God gave us a gift called journey to wholeness, that I had to make a decision. Am I gonna live in a generational curse or am I gonna break the curse? Just just because your grandmama got pregnant before she was married and your mama got pregnant before she was married doesn't mean that you gotta get pregnant before you get married. You gotta make a choice to stay celibate. You gotta make a choice. We used to tell kids all the time, we were youth pastors. We used to tell kids all the time, the the biggest challenge that people have is setting their standards too low in their life. You can't set your standards too high. I used to tell kids, listen, if you make the standard of your life that you're not gonna have sex before you get married, you're probably gonna have sex before you get married. Because if that's the bar, like you just say, I used to try to share that with my kids and then my kids thought I was a nerd when I said, here's what the standard should be. You ain't never gonna be alone with a member of the opposite sex. That's unrealistic. No, it's not. Bring a friend, be in public. 
meet somewhere. Like, it, if you are never alone with a member of the opposite sex, it's pretty hard to get someone pregnant unless you're a freak. I'm just saying. Then you got other issues. This is all I'm saying. So we were talking about this idea of, of these generational things, but I do believe in generational blessings. And I think some of those started last Sunday. I think that there were some guys in here who were like Abram and they were people that had a past and there were people that had problems and there were people that carried all of this drama and all this trauma and they've been dragging it through life. But they got here Sunday and they made a declaration that said, I will be someone who I may not have, I may not have all this and I may not have all the skills and I may not have all that, but I'm gonna be somebody who's gonna stand and who's gonna surrender and is not gonna settle. See, I hope that you'll sacrifice. I hope that you'll surrender because this world's already got too many people who are stopping and settling. And God is not looking for the most talented. He's not looking for the most accomplished. He's looking for people who will represent Him well in both victory and defeat in good times and in bad. And what I wonder is if you'll do that today. I hope you will, because if you will, the world will not be worthy of you. Will you close your eyes all across this place? The world ha, will not be worthy of you. Not because of your talent, not because of your accomplishments, because of your surrender and your sacrifice. Salvation is the goal throughout Scripture. God is trying to save humanity, and He's trying to save you today. Uh, how does He do that? He does that by inviting you into a relationship with Him. Uh, this morning, we want to give you the opportunity to receive that invitation. Uh, you, you do that by doing two things, confessing and professing. Confessing that you have unresolved sin in your life, and professing that you believe that God can change that. And so here's how we're gonna do that today. We're gonna give you the opportunity to, to enter into a relationship, a redemptive relationship with Jesus. Uh, we're gonna give you the opportunity to confess in just a moment by, by simply raising your hand and making eye contact with me. If you do that, uh, once you've made eye contact with me, you can put your hand down, that's your act of confession. Secondly, uh, we're gonna give you the opportunity to profess that you believe that Jesus can change that uh, by, I'm going to say a few lines of a prayer, then I'm going to pause, and I'm going to ask everyone who's in here, saved or not, to repeat it after me. And if you repeat it, and you mean it in your heart, the Bible says that you'll be saved. Uh, so if you're here and you say, Sean, I don't have a relationship with Jesus. I want one before I leave, with nobody looking around. Would you just raise your hand and make eye contact with me right now? Thanks. 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 Thanks left side, anybody? Thanks. 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 Okay. I'm going to ask everybody in here to say this after me. Say, Jesus, I have sin in my life. I don't want it anymore. Please take it. Please forgive me. Change my life. Save me. In Jesus' name. Amen. Secondly, maybe you're here and you say, Sean, I'm saved. I'm a Jesus guy or I'm a Jesus girl. Uh, but you stopped somewhere. You've settled. This, this isn't a spectator sport, incidentally. Uh, but if you're here and you say, Sean, I've, I've stopped somewhere halfway in some area of my life and I'm not everything that I, I could be with the Lord, but nobody looking around. Would you just pop your hand up so that I could pray for you? Yeah. Jesus, for so many people, I pray blessings on them. I pray for peace of their heart and their mind that you'd motivate us, that you'd change us, that you'd help us to become less like us and more like you. Help us move forward. In Jesus' name, amen. As we journey through life, we all have opportunities to be generous. Because you are generous with your time, talent, and resources, together we can be generous by creating engaging in-person experiences, live online services, and fresh virtual resources so that thousands of people on the 920 and beyond can experience the life-changing message of Jesus every single week. Your tithe and above and beyond giving of any amount make it possible to create above and beyond experiences that point to the generosity of God. Online giving is safe, simple, and secure. 
Reoccurring giving makes it even easier. Together, let's be generous.